Hi, everybody. How's it going? That is deeply unenthusiastic. I mean, I appreciate the gesture, wherever it came from. Um, my name is Aiden, and I work here at the library, putting together Live from NYPL, which you are all at, of course. Um, so whether you are here in this room or if you're watching online, um, we are really glad that you're with us. Thank you. Um, and tonight, as I'm sure you know, we are talking Heart Island with our friends from Radio Diaries, uh, whose new season, yeah, give it up for Radio Diaries. I mean, they're pretty cool. Um, their new season is called The Unmarked Graveyard, and it just premiered, um, I believe, a couple weeks ago. And uh, since 1996, they have been giving people audio recorders and working with them to report on their own lives and histories. And um, it sounds like you're all familiar with them, but um, if you aren't, you're going to learn a lot more about them and their work tonight as they go behind some of the stories about Heart Island that they tell in the show. Um, we love Radio Diaries. Another source of inspiration for bringing you tonight's event um, is the library's major exhibition, Treasures, which is right upstairs. It's like kind of over our heads, I think. Um, and it showcases some of the most extraordinary items from among the 56 million in our collections. And uh, it's up for 75 years, so if you haven't seen it yet, you've got some time to check it out. <laughs> so the show is divided into these different thematic sections. And one of the first ones that you see when you come in the room is New York City, which is why we're inspired to do this event tonight. Um, the show, you know, just tells all kinds of stories about New Yorkers and New York history, um, and, you know, because you won't be surprised that we kind of collect like a bunch of stuff about New York City history here. Um, and, you know, it's photographs and maps and stereoscopic photographs and records and um, sets from shows and all kinds of things. So I really encourage you to go check it out. Um, the best way to see Treasures is to go there in person. It's free, it's open any, just about any time the building is open. Um, but you can also learn more on the website, uh, nypl.org slash treasures. In fact, the whole show is available to view there, plus things that are not in the show anymore. Um, so I can't encourage you enough to go check it out. And while Heart Island isn't actually in treasures at the moment, um, we do have some interesting items related to it in our collections. Um, so we put together a little display for you outside. Um, hopefully some of you saw it on the way in, but if not, it will be up on the way out. Uh, everything on it comes from two of my favorite divisions in the building, the maps division and uh, the picture collection, a um, couple of divisions that not everyone knows we have. The map division, aside from being one of the largest, most comprehensive cartographic collections in the world, is also one of the most beautiful rooms in the building. So I really encourage you to go, I don't know, find a cart cartography project you need to do and uh, go check it out. Um, and then there's the picture collection, the weird, wonderful garden of serendipitous rabbit holes that is just unlike any other room in this building. Um, it's been around since 1915, and it is literally a room filled with pictures, clipped from books, magazines, postcards, prints, all kinds of things, arranged into 12,000 subject headings. Everything from uh, US military to typography to insects and pretty much anything you can dream of. And it is a strange little wonderful world of, uh, like I said, rabbit holes to fall into. Um, so you can see some of the things out there from both of those collections. And of course, everyone here has a library card, right? I saw a hand raised. I love that. I used to make people raise their hands to show me who has a library card. So then when someone didn't raise their hand, I could publicly shame them. And then someone told me that was not nice. So I don't do it anymore. The reason I ask is because all you need to use those rooms is your library card. So if you don't have one, go to nypl.org slash library card, get one, and um, go check it out. Uh, so you'll see in your program some of our other upcoming events. Uh, we've got Mary Beard in conversation with Tim Gunn, Pam Jang in conversation with Padma Lakshmi, because all we do is Bravo Liberties, um, Hector Tobar in conversation with Alejandro Varela, and a whole lot more, plus at the end of the month, our annual Halloween costume contest, where one of the judges is also, by the way, Tim Gunn and NYPL librarians, where you come in your most literary-themed costume. It's really fun. Um, and, and a whole lot more. So please go to nypl.org slash live. Uh, see what's on, register, everything is free. We'd love to see you back. 
Um, we're going to start in a second. Just so you know, there are little note cards in your programs. Those are for asking questions, which um, everyone who's speaking tonight will take some of your questions at the end. Um, please write them down in the form of questions, and please make them legible. And then we will get them up here, and they'll answer as many as they can. And if you're watching online, you can put your question in the chat, or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org, and we love to take those as well. Uh, Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and Treasures Programming is made possible by the estate of Helen Sisserson. Uh, we're grateful for that support. We're grateful you're all here. And now, please welcome Radio Diaries founder and executive producer, Joe Richmond, to get things going. Hello. A few years ago, a man was found dead in a park on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. The police couldn't identify him. His body was buried in a pine coffin in a mass grave on Hart Island, a narrow strip of land off of the Bronx. The only marker was a white post that read Plot 383. This is one story. There are more than a million people buried on Hart Island, and there are no headstones or plaques, so it's not easy to find much about who they were. It's known as a place where people end up, where their bodies are unclaimed, or when they've been forgotten. So we set out to tell some of these stories, how people ended up on Hart Island, the lives they lived, and the people they left behind. Neil Harris was last seen in Inwood, New York on December 12, 2014. Hi, Fifi. There were thousands of questions. Where's his family? Where's his people? Uncle Caesar was estranged from our family for 40 to 50 years. The playwright, novelist, and author of Happy Island, Miss Dawn Powell. Holy sh! I know that person. And it's got a name attached to it. Neil Harris Jr. You can't help but wonder what her life has been. I never went back and I never looked for him again. I never found you. She found us and we're here. Now we know who you are. So welcome to the Unmarked Graveyard, um, a new series where we untangle mysteries about people buried in America's largest public cemetery. Thank you all for being here. I'm Joe Richman of Radio Diaries, and I wanted to start with a little bit of background about tonight. Um, in case you haven't, you don't know much about us, about Radio Diaries, we're a nonprofit organization. We've been doing stories for NPR for about 25 years and now on our podcast, and we're known for doing these audio diaries where we... Um, help people tell stories about their own lives, but we do a lot of history as well, tending to be sort of a forgotten, hidden history, buried history. Um, and the original idea for this project was really going to be um, sort of doing uh, like audio obituaries for people who never got them. But that pr that evolved because as we got deeper into each of these stories, they became like really these like more complicated mysteries and um, about people who were forgotten or somehow fell through the cracks. And I like to say that um, this series now is like true crime without the crime. Um, each story is very different, and one is about a missing college student, another about a man estranged from his family for 50 years, another about a composer who made the surprising decision to the choice to be buried on Hart Island. And there's the story I mentioned right at the top about a man who lived in a park for two years on the same bench every day and it was only after he died that the neighborhood residents learned about his true story. So that one aired on NPR yesterday. Uh, tonight you'll be hearing segments from two of these stories. Both are sneak peeks, world premieres. No one else has ever heard this tape. And you'll also meet a woman who has spent the last 30 or so years helping families learn more about Hart Island and, and about their loved ones who were buried there. So to begin, Hart Island is sometimes called a potter's field. It's known as a place where people end up when they can't afford a private burial or the city can't identify them. But there are some stories that don't follow that script. One of those is the writer, Don Powell. Mutual presents... Author! Now we'd like you to meet our guest authors for tonight, the playwright, novelist, and author of Happy Island, Ms. Dawn Powell. Dawn Powell looked on society when she wrote it up. She made fun of millionaires and communists. She was a very smart, tough, sarcastic woman who put all of that into her books. 
When they got back there, you see, he had opened up, and there was a tea room, and it was dinner time, and they had to have the regular blue plate. <laughs> she was a truth teller. Women who pointed things out, women who observed things, women who told the truth. Those kind of women scare men. I do think there will come a time when people will realize that she's one of America's greatest writers. Well, Miss Powell, thank you. Okay, we're going to bring up um, Micah Hazel, who's been working on that story, and she's going to tell you more about Don Powell. Welcome, Micah Hazel. Hi, everybody. <laughs> you can say hi back. It's okay. Um, so Don Powell is one of the few celebrities that are buried on Hart Island. Um, if you don't know who she is, that's okay. You're not out of the loop. Maybe you are. I'll explain why. Um, but Dawn came to our city, New York, in the 1920s, and she wrote a ton of fiction novels, plays, articles, and she was really heavily involved in the writing scene, which was super integrated here in Greenwich Village. And she was friends with a ton of famous writers, some of which we probably all know, Ernest Hemingway, Gore Vidal, you name it. Um, so on paper, very interesting woman, very fun to write a story about. Uh, but when I first started producing this story, I actually didn't really think it was going to work at all. She was born in the 1800s, so her immediate family, you guessed it, dead. <laughs> um, and a lot of the famous writers that she'd befriended were also long gone too. So there just weren't many people who could kind of paint a picture of who she was, especially because there really wasn't that much research about her online. Um, but then I started reading a lot more of her work. She wrote like at least a dozen novels, tons of like witty articles, and she actually wrote in a diary for more than 40 years, like almost every other day, just about her life. And it really gave me a window into how she saw the world beyond just parties and writing society. She was a woman who really ached for success, and all of her characters did too. They were people who came to New York, really wanted to make it, and really just felt disrespected and unappreciated, which is something that I, as a 20-something, definitely can relate to. Um, and also just something that I think is pretty universally human, which is that we all kind of want to be recognized for things that we're really good at, and it's really, kind of a question of life, why we want that so badly. Um, so with that, we'll share her story. Um, the people we talked to for this story are her biographer, Tim Page, who's a critic and writer, and really the only reason her books are back in print and we can read her today. And we also had the pleasure of speaking with writer Fran Leibowitz, who calls herself a Don Powell evangelist <laughs> and is low-key obsessed with her, to be honest, um, and just totally respects her work. So here's a clip from that story. She came from nowhere. She was no one, all right? But she knew that she was smart enough, good enough to be very good in New York, which is the most competitive place in the world. She met people like Fitzgerald and Dorothy Parker, and she knew all of the famous writers. She was very funny, and people liked that, and she liked to drink, so she was out at taverns a lot of the evening, sleeping around and not caring what other people thought. Had best party, had new dress, and was very drunk. Met Floyd Dell at dinner. She started keeping a diary, it touches on her friends, it touches on sights she saw in New York, and the whole city comes alive. I contend that a writer's business is minding other people's business. Okay, so as you can hear, Dawn was a very opinionated woman. If you think writers are opinionated now, you need to read some of her work. She was very brash. Her characters were not necessarily good people. They slept around, they cheated, they lied for success. Um, but Dawn had been through kind of a hard life herself, and she knew that the world is not filled with all good people, and those, those are the people that she wrote about. Um, so naturally, this was not exactly beloved by critics in the 20s. Women really saying anything back then was not really that good. Um, 
And her works didn't make a lot of money. Critics didn't tend to review them a lot. And she really struggled with finances for a lot of her life um, up until the very end. She died from intestinal cancer in 1965. And at the time, she donated her body to science, but it ended up being sent to Heart Island, this mass public grave, which all of our stories are from tonight. Um, so here's a clip of reflections on that. There are people who say, I want this when I die. This is where I want to be buried. This is the kind of gravestone I want. I think Don Powell was too smart and realistic to care about this. I don't think she would have cared. I just don't. I mean, in a weird way, she might have been pleased in a funny way that the city of New York paid for her burial. She loved New York. She told the truth about New York, and I'm not sure she'd want to be anywhere else. The main memorial to Don Powell is in her writing. There is really one city for everyone, just as there is one major love. New York is my city because I have an investment I can always draw on. So Dawn's work, after she died, it kind of disappeared, essentially. Her works went out of print. Her novels really couldn't be found on shelves. I talked to one guy who was like, yeah, I was looking for her books back in the 80s. And when I asked for Don Powell, they were like, do you mean Donald Powell? Like, who, who is that? <laughs> um, but since then, she's kind of gained a little bit of a cult revival. People have been kind of picking up her work and wondering kind of why she's more famous. Um, and something that I really hope this story will do is not just kind of put her books back into the limelight, but put her as a figure back in people's radar. Obviously, we're in a time where we are finally realizing that a lot of people of color, female authors have kind of been buried, and it's up to us to really uncover them as both writers, but also as people. You know, Dawn lived a pretty not the longest life, but definitely a very interesting one, making it as far as she did in the 20s. So I hope that this can help revive her work. Thank you. Thank you, Micah Hazel. And you can hear that story on, on our podcast and also on NPR's All Considered later this month. Um, so throughout history and in many places around the world, cemeteries have been places for people to visit. And some of the most well-known parks in New York City, for example, were once public cemeteries, or Potter's Fields as they were known, uh, Washington Square Park, and the place we are sitting right now, Bryant Park. We are in a cemetery right now, a former cemetery. Um, but for decades, Hart Island has been mostly off limits. Uh, the city started using Hart Island in 1989 as a cemetery. For most of that time, it has been managed by the um, Department of Corrections, which runs the jails. Um, and the people burying bodies in Hart Island uh, were often men incarcerated at Rikers Island nearby. And two years ago, management of the island changed to the uh, New York City Parks Department. And, but still today, going to Hart Island is not easy. You have to be a family member or a close friend. You sign up, there are two visits or so a month. You take a ferry, then you get on a bus, and you, um, you can't just wander around. You are brought to the plot where your family member is, and a little marker is placed where they estimate the body might be. You're given a little bit of time off the bus to pay your respects, and then you get back on the bus, and you get back on the ferry, and you're back. Um, since there are no, I mean, as a team, as uh, Radio Diaries, we were able to visit Hart Island uh, with a few of the characters for our story. And um, personally, for me, a place that was so filled with stigma, um, I found it a place that was very simple, very beautiful, uh, surprisingly beautiful. And I think that that is an experience that, I, that for most of the people we went there with, um, they also came with certain impressions and um, and I think for most of them felt that uh, they left with a different feeling about the place. And here's a clip of that. Oh my God, that's the island. It's crazy. There's not a lot of land for that many people to be buried. 
at first I thought it was eerie, but it's kind of pretty because the fog just like erases the city. It's just so beautiful. It's nicer than I thought. That was Annette Vega, and please welcome Annette Vega. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so when you were seven or eight years old, you found out that your, uh, your father was not your biological father. Correct. And, um, and maybe pull the mic just a little bit closer. Yeah, perfect. And um, as I understand it, from the, as you got older, you got to be more and more curious about it. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that, you know, why, why you got more curious as you got older and sort of what you wanted to learn about your, the father that you never knew, whose name, by the way, was Angel Garcia. Yes. So my, yes, my father's name was Angel Garcia. And from around the age I was seven, seven, eight, I was told that dad wasn't my biological father. And for some time it was, it was just okay. It was, but as I got older, I became more curious, like, where is he? Like, you know, friends had people like, oh, there's my dad, there's my stepdad, and where is this man? And then my mom would, I would do certain things and she was like, oh my God, you remind me of your father. And I was like, really, like how? And she's like, oh, the face you're making, or if I would, as I got older, you're driving too fast. You remind me, just little things that I'm like, well, is it nature, nurture, like the different things. And like, where's, where's the family? Where's, who are these people? Or, you know, why did, as I got older, teens, it's like, why isn't he around or looking for me? I mean, I have a dad. I'm not looking for a replacement, but if this is half of who I am, where is he? And I just became more curious. And I really don't remember what exactly. It was just, I think, a culmination of a lot of little things. Yeah. You interviewed your mom for this story. Um, yes. <laughs> what was her reaction when you first said you wanted to, to interview her for this? So her reaction when I wanted to do this, she was very supportive. But when I asked if I could interview her, she was like, oh, heck no. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> No, 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 you do you, that's your journey, I support you, good job, but uh-uh, I'm not, nope, nope, nope. And then and I spoke to her a little bit, a little, a few more times, and explained the process and what I was going through, and, and she, she finally conceded, I was like, yes. Yeah. And I was still like, at, um, Worry that she may back out at the last second, but she did it. I was really proud of her. And you did record that conversation. Let's hear a part of it right now. Hello. Hey, Mom. Hi, Annette. Hi. So I wanted to ask you some questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. The questions are related to Angel Garcia, who's my biological father. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> All right, mother. So what do you remember about him? He was very sweet. He was good to me. He knew he was good looking. He had this cologne. Oh, my God. It was the best cologne ever. <laughs> he was a charmer, let me tell you. <laughs> he talked about Puerto Rico where his family came from. He talked about the future, uh, when we got married. and Were there things about me that remind you of him? I think you look like him a lot. You, know, you had green eyes. Well, green you, eyes? You had very green eyes like he did. Remember my Monte Carlo, my six-cylinder, that I would be driving fast, and you'd be like, oh, you remind me of your father. And I'm like... Oh, yeah, because he used to love to drive. He used to steal cars. And I think he used to steal cars just for the fun of it. Wow. He was a bad boy. So I guess maybe I was into bad boys. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I think one, one of the reasons we were drawn to do this story with you is because um, you really became like a private investigator by your own life. Yeah. And um, for the past 
few decades, you did a bunch of things to try to find your father. You went to Puerto Rico, you were requesting criminal records, and you signed up for ancestry.com and all of that. And um, I wonder if you could talk about, you learned that your dad might have been a part of a motorcycle gang. I wonder if you could talk about the chinglings and, and yes. kind of digging into that. Yeah, I, I can't recall exactly what moment or what conversation, but it was bits and pieces. <laughs> oh, and, and you can actually, since we've got it here, yeah. you could just talk about this photo too. This photo was sent to me by his second wife, my, my brother's mother. Once we all reconnected, she sent me this picture, and it's like, I think, a traditional prison picture, you know, maybe. But I'd, I've only seen a couple of pictures of him. I had never seen a picture of him. My mother was a typical teenager when they broke up and tore everything, didn't think about the future. Was like, <laughs> she was like, you look like him. I'm looking in the mirror. It's like, how? <laughs> Try to imagine what I look like as a man. But, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I guess. But yeah, I didn't see a picture of him actually until a few years ago. So every now and then it catches me by surprise. But um, yeah, I heard that he had been in gangs and you know, I like my mother said, typical bad boy. And um, so the Chingalings in particular, and I grew up in the Bronx, and at the time I was living in the Bronx, and I had spoken to someone um, about him, because anytime I was around, I, I, I had to get my car fixed, and the guy was a little suspect. And so I said, maybe, you know, maybe all bad guys know each other. <laughs> and I'm like, so do you know this guy? His name is Angel Garcia, he's this and that. They called him my chew, and he was like, I haven't seen him in years. He used to run with the chinglings. And so one day he said, you want me to take you? And I was like, okay. So we drove over there, but he stayed back there. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. And I went, now the, where the chinglings house was is they had all their motorcycles. And if you were walking down the street, you crossed the street, you didn't walk in front of their house. And I just walked up and it's like, hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm looking for my father. <laughs> And they're like, you know, like, not it, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, you know, I asked, I, I stood there and I asked more questions and then they, you know, big burly guy, leather vest, the typical, you know, the beard, the tattoos. And then he calls out for someone else. They come out like, uh, it's like two in the afternoon. They're just waking up and I'm like, hi, sorry to bother. Um, I'm looking for so-and-so. And then a woman came out. Um, no, I'm not gonna say, I was gonna say, she looked like she's, She's had a rough time, but she, she came out and she says, I remember him, such a nice guy. We were partying one night and I overdid it and he carried me up to my room and he didn't do anything and he could have. <laughs> really nice guy. I'm like, wow, <laughs> partying, hanging out, motorcycle, guy. nice guy, okay. And so it was just, it, you know, just putting little pieces to the puzzle of who he was and it was like on paper, all these things I heard, oh, prison, um, you know, bad boy, racing cars, you know, not being a present father for whatever reason. But her, the, the, the thread through all of it was that he was really a nice guy. And I held on to that because, you know, it was interesting. Yeah. So after decades of searching, um, mm -hmm. there's a point in, in the story as we were working together uh, where um, you got a message from on Ancestry.com about uh, about a distant relative, and you went through the white pages, and you start kind of combing through all that, and you then you finally got a call. Yeah, it was, um, real quick, it was a DNA match. It was a second cousin, and there was some correspondence over three months. He was like, oh, we're related. I'm your, your, your grandmother's, my grandfather's brother, sister. I was like, yes, how do we, and didn't respond for six weeks. I was like, oh my God. But anyway, I, <laughs> Finally, she responded several months later, and she was like, oh yeah, your grandmother, because on my ancestry on the tree, if anyone's ever done it, you put who you have, and then it opens up another link, and all I had was Angel Alberto Garcia, and what I knew is my grandmother's name was really close. And so that's who she, she was like, oh, we're cousins, and that's how we connect. So when we spoke, she told me, I know your aunt. Her name, and she gave me her name. She's like Miriam. Um, she was a teacher. My mother had told me, you have an aunt that's, your father had a sister and a brother. 
and your aunt was a teacher. I was like, okay, this is it. And then um, she said she lived in, in, in a town called um, Cypress Springs. And it happened to be, um, I was like, where's Cypress Springs? She was like, in Florida. And Cypress Springs happened to be a, a part of Orlando, Florida, where I had just moved five months ago, prior. It's like, so I happened to be off that day, and I just kept checking for the name. She told me the husband's name. She told me what my cousin's names were. And I, I ended up finding a match. Like, it'll show um, in the white pages, you pay $1.99. And they, you, you can see everyone who's lived in the household. So I said, it all matches. There was a phone number. And I was like, oh, God, now this is all these years. And I called my mother. And I was like, I think I found my aunt. There's a phone number. She was like, did you call? I was like, no, I can't call. And she was like, what do you mean you can't call? And I think I was just so afraid of rejection that I took the, the roundabout way, the modern day way, social media. So I looked for the names of... Um, of my cousins, and I sent them this long, drawn out, as I typically do, um, message, you know, who I was, and trying to validate, and I was like, I don't want anything, I just want to know, where is he, who am You said dad? you were afraid of rejection, just say yeah. a little more about that? Yes, I was, I was afraid, like, well, one is, do they know that, my, even though my mother told me, yes, he, they all knew, you know, his sister knew, his, your grandmother knew about you, but what if... I don't know, maybe if they didn't believe it, maybe they forgot about me, or what if they didn't want anything to do with me? They're like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So, I was, yeah, I was really afraid of rejection, and I, I didn't call. I had the number in front of me, but I didn't call. I, I, I looked towards a peer, because, you know, my aunt would be the closest thing, connection right at that, that moment to my father. So, I sent them messages, and then later that day, like I started this journey, so when I opened up the email that morning with the name of my aunt and her husband, I just spent the whole day looking and about eight o'clock at night, I got a phone call from my cousin, her oldest son. And um, he, was, he said, he spoke mostly Spanish and he said, you're, uh, you're my cousin. She was, he was, you, you are, and he was like, and you have a sister and you have three brothers and we're in Orlando. I thought you were in Puerto Rico. How do, you're in Orlando, I'm in Orlando. And I, it was just like, you knew about me? And he was like, yeah. Grandma used to always say, you're not the oldest. You have a cousin. Uh, there's a little girl in New York City who's the oldest, the, my oldest grandchild. And I was like so touched. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm not being rejected. And then he, um, he said, my mother, she is, she's, she's going to, She's going to go crazy. She's not going to believe it. He said, can I call you back? I was like, please call me back. Don't, like, don't even hang up. I'm like, this is the well, first connection. Well, in your story, you go to visit. So, yeah, why don't we hear that part right now? Okay. Yeah. Right. Mira, yo recibí una llamada de él. She said she received a phone call from him in the summer of 1989 that he was very sick with pneumonia and he wanted to come home. Con mi esposo. Después yo fui a Nueva York. Her and her husband went to New York. Por mucho, mucha calle. They walked through the streets tiempo. looking for him. Pero no. Pero más nunca volví a saber de él. But she never heard from him again. She hasn't seen him in 30 years. She said, I don't think he's alive. Yeah, so that scene, you're talking about a lot of things, learning a lot of things about um, your father, and then, of course, you learn that he hasn't been seen for so long. What What was your reaction to that? It was when, she, when they said, yeah, we haven't seen him. We He told me that he had AIDS, and then he went to New York City, and then he said he was really sick. He was in the hospital, and he just wanted to come back home to Puerto Rico because they were still living in Puerto Rico. And I said, okay, so then what happened? Oh, we never heard from him again. And she, okay, but then what happened? <laughs> like, what do you mean you never heard from him again? And she, we don't know. I mean, we don't know if he's still in New York or maybe he died. And you know, I'm a nurse, and I'm like, oh, 1989? 
he had AIDS, he had pneumonia. Yeah, he's dead. Where? Like, I mean, and it was weird because I didn't, I don't think at the time I like processed it. Like, damn, I'm never, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm never going to meet him. Um, it was just like, I have to, I have to continue and find out where he is, where, where. And, um, and that's when I went back to the internet and it's, well, I called my best friend and um, she's a retired NYPD officer and we spoke. I was like, okay, I, feel, I got her up to date and he said, 1989, he called from a hospital, where would he be? And we agreed, we were like, Potter's Field? Because that's what I knew it was growing up. It was Potter's Field and it was, you know, I feel not ashamed, but it, you know, growing up, it was a joke. It was like, oh, that guy's going to end up in Potter's Field. It was just where people, you know, the homeless person or things like that. It was just the perception in, 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 in my youth um, with regards to people that didn't have a family or weren't cared for. Like, well, if the fam, he was on the run, so I'm like, well, would they have notified family? Would they have known who to notify? So it's like, okay, Potter's Field. And then I typed in Potter's Field and popped up Heart Island. I was like, what is Heart Island? And from there, I started searching. And I actually was like, well, I, I see a plot number. I see there were five Angel Garcias. So it took me a while to get the math right because I was so excited. But I was like, OK, this person died in 1989. And he's the age of 37 at his death. The math is math and you know, see. okay, what do I do next? And then um, I emailed uh, Melinda Hunt and then she told me, she gave me some suggestions on how to proceed. And from there I used the plot number, I believe it was. So much, my mind was racing. <laughs> and, and then I requested a death certificate and the death certificate just said, Angel Garcia, 37 years of age, Unknown, 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 unknown. Um, died of pneumonia, um, secondary to AIDS from chronic IV drug abuse. And I was like, that's gotta be him. But I gotta prove it. And then try to prove that. And so I gotta get an autopsy. And mm -hmm. then an autopsy report, so I had to request that. And then it's just waiting weeks and waiting, I was like, you know, I've waited all these years since I was 18, 17, 18, when I was really looking. And then the autopsy, it's a description, height, weight, color hair, the, the marks on his arm. And then um, in the report, it said his spleen was missing. And the story was he had been shot at one time and his spleen had been surgically removed. So it was like, that's it, you know, it's, proof that he's there. We want to end with this is a beautiful scene that I know you haven't heard yet about um, you visiting Heart Island for the first time with your brother who you hadn't met before. To, right, you met yeah. there at Heart Island. But before we go to that scene, I want to ask you about that the experience of looking for him, hoping that you would find him alive. Mm -hmm. And then s at some point along your search, realizing that maybe that wasn't the search and you just wanted to find where he was. Can you talk about that transition and maybe why it even became important to find his where he was buried? Yeah, it it was about it's weird because it was about finding him and meeting him. But thinking through it and through the whole journey, meeting him, I don't think I would have got to know him. But not meeting him personally and find and meeting everyone in the family and how they knew him, it, that's how I found him, by my mother's memories and my aunt's memories and you know the memories of my brothers when they were kids and the funny stories. So I, I found him physically on Heart Island, but I think I, I, I truly found him in finding my family. And, and that process, it was a journey, and it's not, it's not what I went into it for. And obviously, you know, hoping you find, you hope you to meet the person, and get to know them. But I, you know, I had extensive conversations with, with different people, with my brothers, 
mother, like I said, my aunt, my cousins, and chinglings, and you know, everybody just giving me different perspectives on, on him. And then just um, my, the stereotype of, of Potter's Field and Heart Island. I was just like, he's not there. He's, he's in here, he's in everybody, he's in the memories, he's not there. And then, and I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna go there. I, I was just like, I'm just gonna let him live where he is. I don't wanna visit that place. And when I went there, my whole perspective changed. It was, it was almost like the period at the end of a sentence in a novel. It was just like, boom, it's, it's, it's good, it's yeah. good. It was, it was beautiful, it was a beautiful place. Thank you, it's beautiful. Let's hear that last scene. I don't wanna hear it. <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. I can't believe I'm standing here with my brother. He's like, it's small. It's like, he's so cute. Look at him. Thank you. I'm like, it was so nice. I found out that I had a brother named Angel. I've never met him. He also didn't know where our father was. She reached out to me and wrote me a letter telling me she was my sister. I was incarcerated. I was incarcerated, so at first I was like, what? What the hell is going on here? She went into detail, telling me who she is and how she went about finding me. So and, all her research had paid off. I know, I should be a private investigator. Yes. <laughs> the Gar the Gar 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 yes. Now we're gonna go see our father where he was buried. It's, it's weird, like nobody knew where he was at all these years. Section three. Right there, 201, grave 27. Yeah. So this is the plot where Angel was buried. My dad. Our dad. Wow. I was always his biggest fan, like rooting for him. Yeah. I must have been like seven years old. And we went to the prison to visit him. And he took us from the visiting room to, to like the dormitory. He introduced us to all of the dudes that was locked up with him or his friends or whatever. And he gave me like a boat made out of like wood and, and that's the last time that I seen him. Well, now I know where he's buried. The people that loved my father, whether it my brother, my aunt, my cousins, everyone talks about how he was such a good guy. <laughs> I think they were afraid to tell me the bad stuff, whether it's being in a gang or in prison, being an IV drug abuser. You know, Angel was not an angel, but it's who he is. I mean, it's not a complete story without all of it. I'm putting flowers here at his grave, just planting and marking, because he's here. He's not lost. I'm happy to see where he lays and to like uh -huh. tell him like, yo, Annette found you, she found us, and we're here. Now we know where you are. El Rio de Corozal Thank you for sharing your story on the radio, the podcast. <laughs> Annette Vega. So as you've heard in these stories, um, it can be challenging to find out information about people buried on Heart Island. Um, or even to find out if someone is even there. Um, we talked to many people who for years um, had no idea what had happened to their brother or their mother or their child. So the fact that we're able to make a series of stories about this place, um, we owe a lot to a woman named Melinda Hunt, and I want to introduce you to her now.
So Melinda Hunt is a visual artist and she runs the Heart Island Project. And for the last 30 years or so, she's been pushing to make Heart Island and the stories of people buried there um, easier to access. And I want to just ask you, first of all, just about the Heart Island Project and how it began. Uh, the Heart Island Project uh, started a year after I became a naturalized citizen. Uh, the process of becoming naturalized requires that you take a test and that you can speak English. And when I went to court uh, to take the test, I was one of the few people who passed. There were lots and lots of people who didn't speak English well enough to be able to read the paragraph that the judge put in front of them. And it was very traumatic. And I remember thinking, gosh, what happens to these people? And so it was during the AIDS epidemic. So friends of mine were dying. And there would sometimes be a memorial service, but sometimes the family wasn't there. And we didn't really know what happened to the body of somebody who died. And at that time, funeral directors were refusing to take care of the family and handle the body of someone who died of AIDS. And marriage wasn't legal for, same-sex marriage wasn't legal. And so people who viewed themselves as married weren't acknowledged by the law to be able to handle the body of their loved one. And it was terrible. So for the anniversary of Jacob Rees, the centennial of Jacob Rees, whose book, How the Other Half Lived, really changed housing in New York City and really the rest of the country, um, I invited Joel Sternfeld a photographer to work with me on a book documenting the burials on Heart Island that uh, using the same type of camera, an eight by 10 land camera, to show something in New York City that was essentially unchanged and affected huge numbers of people. And uh, so uh, I went out there and had access because at that time, the media and researchers had access, but families didn't. And in 1994, I negotiated taking a woman who wanted to commemorate the 40th anniversary of her baby, Denise, who died shortly after birth. And we took her there. Uh, and she wasn't able to visit an actual grave site because we didn't have access to the records. So then after my book came out and lots of families started contacting me for help gaining access, I started a documentary film about them. And as soon as the film was done, I uh, began working with a lawyer, David Rankin, who is a freedom of information law attorney, uh, to get records for these family members. So they had a confirmation of their relative being buried there. It wasn't just the death certificate saying city cemetery. They wanted a formal document that showed what day, what place, where was their relative actually. And when I met with the attorney, I was just seeking to help the few families who had asked for help. But he said, let's not do this one by one. Let's get all the records. Starting 1985 through present, how many records do you think they are? And I said, 50,000. And he said, let's get 50,000. Because if the city has lost 50,000 burial records, I can take that to a judge and we can get something done. If the city loses the record of one person, I don't think a state judge is going to look at that. So uh, he prepared a FOIL request that, and we thought that we were going to have to sue the city. 
and it was written in such a way that the city lawyers could see that they weren't going to be able to defend this. And uh, so uh, in March 13th, 2008, I got a call from the attorney that he had received 50,000 burial records. And, uh, <laughs> and a reporter from the Times came uh, to document us getting these records. And the reporter asked me, well, what are you going to do with them? And in that moment, I said, I'm going to create an online database so that people can get access to this information. And I think we have maybe another couple images or another image from the database just to give you a sense of, yeah, so this is Angel Garcia. Yeah. From, so we created the database yeah. with all of the information that was on these ledgers. And I had seen these ledgers when I was out there working on my book. So I knew they existed. I knew where they kept them. And one of the reasons for doing this FOIL request was that the city had lost records from 1961 through 1977. They had lost all of the records in a fire because they didn't have copies. And uh, so I wanted to get these records partly just to get the city to make copies so this wouldn't happen again. Uh, so I, I started out making the database, and then I got a grant from New York State Council on the, Mar on the Arts to create a storytelling platform, an interactive database. And, and we did that, first of all. And then I decided, well, we need a map so that people can see the scale of this, because it's just, there are you know over 75,000 burials just since 1980, which is how far the records go back for in our database. And uh, so, so after the first rendition of Traveling Cloud Museum, then, then I figured out that we could uh, map the island with a drone and Drones aren't legal to launch in New York City, but, but Hard Island's right on the edge of the city, so if you had a boat <laughs> in Nassau County and you could fly the drone over Hard Island, technically you weren't launching it in New York City. And it also turned out that, that LaGuardia Airport controls the airspace over Hard Island. The city doesn't actually own the air rights. So, so you could fly this drone and as long as you were 50 feet above you know, the land, and you didn't land it, it was legal. So that's I mean, how we did the drone thing. And, and this was working with licensed drone pilots, one of whom was this wonderful guy who had developed drones for the Department of Defense in Iraq, and he was a drone photographer, like, really good at it. And they, they had figured out the laws and stuff, and and knew that we could do this legally. So, let, let me just so, jump in, because there are, there are a few things that I just really love. I mean, first of all, I, I recommend you all check out this this yeah. website, hardisland.net. Yeah. And um, because it's incredible storytelling database, and just you, right. not just the stories that are there, but the stories that aren't there, and that you ha kind of have a... Well, the purpose of it, really, um, as an artist, was to figure out a way to reconnect the city to its cemetery through storytelling, because the primary function of a cemetery is storytelling. Yeah, and it, it raises another question, which I just love about about you, is that you came to this as an artist, and this has become your art project. Oh and yeah, it's always been the art project. That. You you hit these walls, and then you just have to get creative, right? You can't, you know. I I've always wanted. I never wanted to break any laws. I just wanted to change the laws. Like I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I just don't think that this that it it's sustainable for the city of New York to keep this many people from visiting the graves of their babies. It just doesn't make any sense to me, and it seems so un-American. And since I became an American citizen, now I have to carry that weight. <laughs> so you know, you could. If we could just reintroduce storytelling and get the media to cover it and to you know, <laughs> deconstruct these mass graves into individual stories, that that would change it. And so it's this slow process. But now 
you know, Parks has jurisdiction, but HRA is managing the burials, and now they've stopped collecting GPS for these grave sites. So if you move one of these posts, and they have been straightening out the markers, you lose the grid, and you lose all the people in that grave. So this is really a, an important issue right now, and they're about to start a master plan, and there's no GPS, all of these things are stuff that citizens need to uh, take care of. Melinda, and we have some questions from the audience, and um, and we have about ten minutes left. So, but let me just, while I'm going through some of these, um, one question would just be: How is access changing, and what do you think is the future of access for families and and for the general public? Well, um, in in twenty. 12, we petitioned the city for the right of eight women to visit the graves of their babies and were, had attorneys ready to fight that. And uh, the city capitulated and agreed that these eight women could visit the graves of their babies. And then a year later, the New York Civil Liberties Union uh, filed a federal class action lawsuit that secured the rights of families to visit. But the Parks Department is just following the letter of the law. And so you can only go to, you have to check the box that you have a close personal relationship to someone buried. And then you can only go to that. And the parks uses parks police and all this stuff, all this prison stuff carried over. So it's better because it's not correction officers, but you still can't walk around and you can't congregate, and people can't support one another. You know, like, when you, when you go there, you want to visit other people's graves and learn their stories and find out that you have things in common with other what people. What would you like to have happen? Um, I, think, I, I think everybody who goes there realizes that this stigma is not necessary. It's a beautiful location, and the parks is about to start a master plan, and they're not really looking at it as it's the largest natural burial ground in the United States. It's a fantastic place, and we don't have to talk about it in these dark ways. We can celebrate these lives. We can come together and reconcile death, and it's extremely important with all of the immigrants who come into New York, New York City, legal and illegal, those people are part of American history, and it's part of us. So what I need is for people to show up and to care and to be interested in these stories. So I think that it should be open. I think the New Yorkers should ask their parks department, ask their mayor, ask their city council to resume marking graves with GPS so we don't ever lose track of people again, to allow people to visit without having to talk about their personal relations. I mean, what right does the government have to ask you to check a box that you, certifying that you have a personal relationship to someone buried? Why wouldn't you want to visit the grave of, of the guy who made your sandwich every day? We should want to celebrate those lives, and we shouldn't have to declare our relationships. That, that's overreach by government. So I think it needs to be, a, I think it needs, the master plan needs to be about opening access and allowing people to freely visit and talk about this place and reconnect with families that maybe there was some disconnect, but those connections can be renewed. And, and that everybody can feel that they can visit there and that they're not ashamed of this place, that they're proud of their history and their families and their communities. That's what a cemetery is for. And we're spending... Yeah. We're spending $82 million. The city has spent $82 million on Hard Island the last three years, and 80 people a month are allowed to visit. That is not a good return on your tax dollars. Bottom line, 
we need to have access if we've spent this much money on this place. I think that is a great place to leave it. I'll, I'll just hint that there were some questions, some more questions for you, some questions about stories we do, and I'll just say that um, to answer some of them a little bit, it strikes me that although the Heart Island Project and Radio Diaries are so different, there is such a uh, shared spirit in this idea of trying to find stories that were never told, the shards of things, how do you connect someone asked And what, letting people tell their own stories. Letting people tell their own stories and and Someone asked, uh, what are the kinds of stories we look for? And we're looking for stories that are, people are trying to figure out what's going on in their own lives and stories. So um, I'm glad. I think this was a beautiful collaboration, and thank you. Um, I'll answer all your questions at I was contact say, at heartisland.net. <laughs> yeah, heartisland.net. And all we will also hang around here a little bit longer, so feel free to come up um, afterwards. I just want to say thank you, Melinda Hunt. Thank you, Annette Vega, for joining us tonight um, to hear more stories from the series, of course. Go to our podcast, and you can hear them on NP on the podcast on Thursdays, NPR on Mondays. And um, thank you to the library for this event. It's been really fun working working with the folks here. Uh, thank you to the wonderful producers and the team at Radio Diaries, Micah Hazel, who you met earlier, Nellie Gillis, Elisa Scarce, Lena Engelstein, and our editors, Ben Shapiro and Deborah George. Thanks to our podcast network, Radiotopia. We are a nonprofit organization, so if you like what we do, we encourage you to check us out, and you can subscribe, donate, sign up for our newsletter, uh, or just come talk to us. And um, one more thing, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, some other people who have connection to Heart Island here in the audience. I met a few of you, the Heart Island sisters, who come and visit every month and kind of like support each other as they go around to their um, the grave sites of their loved ones. So I really appreciate all the connections to Heart Island here in this room. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>